So one of the key events that occurs that uh, consolidates Andy Dufresne's position as a kind of legendary figure within Shawshank Prison is uh, the actions that he takes uh, during this rooftop uh, scene where uh, he confronts uh, the guard Byron Hadley about um, the situation that Hadley is in in regards to his um, his inheritance and it is Andy that sort of steps up and compromises the divisions of power between the guard and the prisoner and helps Hadley set up uh, a financial sort of agreement where Hadley would uh, not have to pay taxes on this sum of money so he's really uh, helping himself in this moment by forming a relationship with Hadley and the guards and establishing himself uh, as somebody who knows what he's talking about in regards to finances and we also see Andy sort of making a gesture of kindness and friendship to the other inmates by negotiating uh, beers for all of the men who are working as a crew on this rooftop so this scene is really, um, it, it sort of uh, solidifies Andy's place within uh, and amongst the prisoners as somebody who is different and special in some way. He stands up for himself and uh, he's not afraid of uh, questioning uh, the authority, in this case Byron Hadley. Um, so we can sort of... Uh, watch the film clip of this scene and again uh, determine or think about uh, how Andy sort of subverts the power structure that's been established between the guards and the inmates. 20% of course. So this big shot lawyer calls me long distance from Texas. I say yeah. He says, uh, sorry to inform you, but your brother just died. Oh damn, Byron, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm not. He was an asshole. Ran off years ago. Figured him for dead anyway. So anyway, this lawyer fellow says to me, his brother died a rich man. Oil wells and shit. Close to a million bucks. A million bucks? Yeah. Fucking incredible how much some assholes get. Jeez Louise, you gonna see any of that? 35,000. That's what he left me. Dollars? Yep. Holy shit, that's great. That's like one in the sweepstakes. Dumb shit, what do you think the government's gonna do to me? Take a big wet bite out of my ass is what? Poor Barry. Terrible fucking luck, huh? You crying shame. <laughs> Some people really got it awful. Andy, you nuts. Keep your ass on your mop, man. Andy. Well, all right, you're gonna pay some taxes, but you'll still end up. Oh, what? yeah, yeah. Maybe enough to buy a new car, and then what? I gotta pay tax on the car. Repair, maintenance, goddamn kids pestering you to take them for a ride all the time. At the end of the year, you figure the tax wrong, you gotta pay them out of your own pocket. I tell you, Uncle Sam, puts his hand in your shirt and squeezes your tit till it's purple. He's a truth, man, he never gets a break. That's the truth. He said, Rich, get in yourself, Carol. I keep telling him, no. Some brother. Shit. Hey! Mr. Hadley. Trust your wife. Oh, that's funny. You're gonna look funnier sucking my dick with no teeth. What I mean is, do you think she'd go behind your back trying to hamstring you? That's it. Step aside, Mert. This fucker's having himself an accident. You don't push him off the roof. Because if you do trust her, there's no reason you can't keep that 35,000. What did you say? 35,000. 35,000. All of it. All of it. Every penny. Better start making sense. If you want to keep all that money, give it to your wife. The IRS allows a one-time only gift to your spouse for up to $60,000. Oh, shit. Tax-free? Tax-free. IRS can't touch one cent. You're that smart banker would kill his wife, aren't you? Why should I believe a smart banker like you? So I can end up in here with you? It's perfectly legal. Go ask the IRS. They'll say the same thing. Actually, I feel stupid telling you this. I'm sure you would have investigated the matter yourself. Yeah, fucking A. I don't need no smart wife killing banker to tell me where the bear's sitting in the buckwheat. Of course not. But you do need someone to set up the tax free gift for you. That'll cost you. A lawyer, for example. A bunch of ball washing bastards. Right. I suppose I could set it up for you. That would save you some money. If you get the forms, I'll prepare them for you. Nearly free of charge. 
I'd only ask three beers apiece for each of my co-workers. <laughs> co-workers, get in. That's rich, ain't it? I think a man working outdoors feels more like a man if you can have a bottle of suds. That's only my opinion. Sir. What are you, Jimmy, staring at? Back to work! Let's go to work! That's how it came to pass, that on the second to last day of the job, the convict crew that tarred the plate factory roof in the spring of 49 wound up sitting in a row at 10 o'clock in the morning, drinking icy cold Bohemia-style beer, courtesy of the hardest screw that ever walked a turn at Shawshank State Prison. Wake up while it's cold, ladies. The colossal prick even managed to sound magnanimous. We sat and drank with the sun on our shoulders and felt like free men. Hell, we could have been tarring the roof of one of our own houses. We were the lords of all creation. As for Andy, he spent that break hungered in the shade, a strange little smile on his face, watching us drink his beer. So in that scene, we uh, saw how Andy was able to sort of invert or um, undermine the power structure of uh, between the guards and the inmates, where the guards have all the power and the inmates are seemingly uh, powerless and uh, view, viewed by the guards as sort of worthless, uh, just labor, right? Exploitable labor uh, by the higher-ups. Uh, but in this scene, Andy sort of proves his worth and his superiority in terms of his intelligence over a man like Hadley, who is just sort of uh, this violent, um, violent guard at the prison, right? So who uh, he's not uh, as smart as Andy, and as sort of uh, is shown in this scene. Andy's motivation is also sort of uh, discussed in, in this part where um, Red is sort of suggesting, well, why is Andy doing this? Is it a way to sort of curry favor, uh, to gain sort of important or influential friends amongst the guards that can help protect him at a later time? Or is it to uh, make friends with the inmates by doing uh, this kind gesture? Red suggests that maybe it's just Andy's way of sort of uh, preserving that little bit of uh, freedom um, to feel like he is a free man in this moment and he uses the term co-workers right instead of inmates because he sees each man as being a sort of valuable uh, member of society of even if it's in incarceration uh, they're not just prisoners they are more than that and then on the bottom of page 46, we have uh, Red describing uh, this scene and the importance of this scene. Uh, so he says, suddenly it was Andy who had the upper hand. It was Hadley who had the gun on his hip and the billy in his hand. Hadley who had his friend grade Stamus behind him and the whole prison administration behind Stamus. The whole power of the state behind that. But all at once, in the golden sunshine, it didn't matter. And I felt my heart leap up in my chest as it never had since the truck drove me and four others through the gate back in 1938. And I stepped outside. I stepped out into the exercise yard. It was man against man, and Andy simply forced him the way a strong man can force a weaker man's wrist to the table to, in a game of Indian wrestling. So in this scene, Andy has overpowered through his intellect, uh, his uh, opposition with Hadley and gained the upper hand. So uh, in this way, it inspires Red. He says, I've never felt my heart leap in my chest uh, the same way uh, since I entered here. So it seems as if Andy is sort of bringing with him a sense 
of hope or inspiration that allows the other men to feel uh, at least a little bit um, a sense of freedom or importance that maybe they didn't even enjoy that they didn't have uh, or they don't have uh, while incarcerated. And this also sort of consolidates or um, concretizes Andy's place uh, as a sort of legendary figure. Page 48, uh, Red sort of talks about the way that uh, Andy is sort of remembered and his memories are sort of passed on between men and it becomes a sort of a mythic figure within Shawshank Prison and he says, I thought there were nine or ten of us but by 1955 there must have been 200 of us, maybe more, if you believe what you heard. So as the prisoners would tell the story, they would add themselves as one of the crew uh, rather than sort of uh, just say that they had heard this happen. So this is part of the prison uh, communication, how it works in prison. The stories are spread and elaborated and exaggerated. And then Red goes on, so yeah, if you asked me to give you a flat out answer to the question of whether I'm telling you about a man or a legend, that got made up around the man like a pearl around a little piece of grit, I'd have to say that the answer lies somewhere in between. All I know for sure is that Andy Dufresne wasn't much like me or anyone else, anyone else I ever knew since I came inside. He brought in $500, jammed up his back porch, but somehow the gray meat son of a bitch managed to bring in something else as well, a sense of his own worth maybe, or a feeling that he would be the winner in the end, or maybe it was that only a sense of freedom. Even inside these goddamn gray walls, it was a kind of inner light he carried around with him. I only knew him to lose that light once, and that is also part of the story. So Andy's character, he has this inner light that seems to be sort of broken or uh, damaged or obstructed in the other men, um, but he seems to have this inner light and inspires the other men to sort of uh, reclaim or find within themselves a sense of light or freedom uh, that comes from inside that can't be sort of broken by uh, the oppressive system of the prison. And I also like that little detail there in the language if you pay attention to some of the language that Red as a narrator uses. It sort of has this thread of rocks in geology sort of um, he uses this in his imagery and it's a strong sense of voice in this the narrator right he, he uses a lot of sort of profanity and interesting turns of phrases but he says of Andy um, I'm trying to tell you about a man or a legend that got made up around the man like a pearl around a little piece of grit so even that image of pearl it's a simile here, like a pearl around a little piece of grit, that's how this legend grows around Andy. Even that sort of goes back to the how the novel sort of emphasizes geology and rocks uh, in the formation of something beautiful around something seemingly, uh, you know, discarded, a piece of grit. We don't think much of that, but then it can turn into a pearl, something beautiful and precious. So that sort of again goes back to Andy's work with the quartz rocks and how he polishes uh, the rocks in the exercise yard and turns them into something beautiful. Uh, so that's one of the sort of uh, underlining images that will repeatedly be evoked by King uh, through the narrating voice. And I think that also speaks to the prisoners themselves as a reflection of how uh, Andy is able to sort of improve their lives a little bit and he is like that pearl uh, amongst the grit of the prison system.